Welcome, my name is Scott Newsom, neurologist at Johns Hopkins and director of our Johns Hopkins Stiff Person Syndrome Center. Thank you for tuning in uh, to you know, listen to this really important topic, SPS spectrum disorders, so stiff person spectrum disorders. I'll refer to this as SPSD moving forward. Just to give you a little bit of demographic and important clinical characteristics of this disease. Uh, so the prevalence is said to be one in two cases per million. However, this really is probably more common than what's quoted, and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, symptoms typically start in middle age, so 40s to 50s. Uh, however, I will say I've seen children uh, with this disease. I've also seen people present in their 80s with the initial symptoms. So don't just pigeonhole people into what is textbook. Uh, commonly, uh, females are involved, and this is similar to what other autoimmune conditions. It's about two to one. Uh, it takes several years, actually, for most people to get diagnosed from symptom onset to diagnosis. And in part, this is because of this expanding spectrum of disorders that we're noticing that fall under this SPSD uh, umbrella. Now, in specific clinical phenotypes, the most common is what we call classic SPS. So this is what I think gets the most uh, news. Uh, and these are individuals that will present with torso rigidity, spasms, maybe in their abdominal musculature, their back. They also will have leg spasms more than arms, uh, followed by SPS plus, which is, you know, classic features plus brainstem and or cerebellar involvement. So patients will come in, for example, with, let's say, a stiff leg, uh, you know, rigid torso, but then they also have double vision, they have ocular motor problems, speech issues, gait ataxia. Um, so very important to recognize, because again, from symptom onset to diagnosis, many of these people are many years out from their diagnosis. Uh, then we have partial SPS, which is typically patients who have just torso or leg involvement. So maybe it's rigid or spastic. Um, eventually over time, most of these patients will uh, be deemed as having classic SPS. Then there's a potpourri of other phenotypes that are less common, including PERM, maybe more pure cerebellar ataxia and some overlapping syndrome. But I, I just want to give you an idea of this expanding clinical phenotypes uh, because, again, we want to make diagnosis sooner because we have treatments available, which I'll talk about in a minute, that can really help, I think, improve quality of life for many people and maybe uh, improve long-term outcomes. Now, on exam, the typical features that we will see with those involved in musculoskeletal um, uh, system is hyperlordosis. So we'll see some people with uh, the lordotic curve being uh, really uh, hyperlordotic and very tight, rigid torso, spasticity can occur, hyperreflexia. Uh, so anything that you have seen uh, cause an upper motor neuron syndrome, we can see in stiff person syndrome. And it goes back to uh, the thought of the GABAergic pathways being involved, this hyper um, excitability syndrome. So it's something to be aware of. Other things in terms of diagnostic workup, we will do a broad serological workup. Things specific or more specific, I should say, to SPSD are, is the anti-GAD65 antibody test, which is seen in up to 80% of people. Uh, however, I will caution that if it's low positive, you have to be uh, suspicious that maybe they don't have SPSD because this can be seen at low titers in diabetes, other neurological conditions. So it's really high titer. We're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Then there are other commercially available tests called amphipycin antibody, glycine receptor antibody uh, test as well. Uh, we will do lumbar punctures in some of our patients. We'll do EMGs to look for co-contraction, agonist antagonist, uh, muscles, continuous motor unit, potential activity. But the rest of the workup, honestly, is ruling out other things. So looking to make sure there's no demyelinating disorders, no tumors, uh, to see maybe the workup is completely normal and maybe the person has a functional neurological uh, disorder. Uh, now, there are a small percentage of people that will have a perineoplastic etiology, very low in percentage. You can read about that, usually breast cancer, small cell lung cancer. And then on to treatment, uh, we like to do this combination approach of symptomatic uh, and non-pharmacological intervention, along with immune-based treatment. So GABAergic agonists like Valium, Clonopin, Baclofen, um, immune-based treatments like IVIG, which is my first line, and then plasma exchange, uh, rituximab, CELSEP, and a whole host of other immune-based treatments. 
And then non-medication interventions, aqua therapy, acupuncture, acupressure, massage therapy, there's a whole list of things. And I will end with this, uh, that the combination of these treatments, in my experience, have helped people the most. So it's not one extreme to the other. And I thank you for your attention.